Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble, listen, must reflect the image of Jesus fully. If we allow Jesus, by his precious spirit, to fully live in us, our character will reflect the character of Christ, and the Father will write his name in our forehead. God wants to place his signature on us because we are his masterpiece of creation. We are made in his image. Okay, I have to warn you that I'm going to start this sermon off, sermon off with some dusty old memories, right? Which, of course, is just another way of saying what I usually say, I remember way, way, way back when. Well, this particular iteration of way, way, way back when refers primarily to grade school years. Can you guys remember grade school years? Well, I can. You, yes, you, we know you. <laughs> For me, grade school years meant riding that little blue bicycle the four or five blocks to our little three-room Adventist church school in Chico, California. Okay, I, I remember many, many things about the seven years I spent at that school. I remember reading, writing, arithmetic, and the last R is recess, right? Recess. And I remember recess. I remember recesses of kickball and Red Rover. I remember that there was always a little bit of irony when it came to summer vacations. I don't know if this uh, resonates with you, but specifically about halfway through each school year, we couldn't wait for summer vacation, right? But then somehow, about halfway through summer vacation, well, we were itching to get back to school. How weird is that? I guess it must be a component of human nature, you see? Even as kids in grade school, it seems we are never satisfied. But that's not the real point of this uh, particular trip down memory lane. You see, I happen to remember something else. I remember that at the start of each new school year, we were always super excited to get our brand new textbooks. Oh, we couldn't wait to get them. We would we'd sit down, we'd start leafing through all of them and just go, wow, we're gonna learn this this year? And another thing that we always, always did is we would carefully and meticulously sign our names on the front inside cover of the new book. Do you remember doing that? Because that, that made it official. See, from that point on, we were officially in the fourth grade or the fifth grade or the sixth grade, etc. And by the way, these books look really familiar to me. I think I, I think I did read those. You know, if I were able to produce those old grade school textbooks and show you the inside covers, I believe you would notice a very interesting, if not comical, progression of signatures. See, it would be a progression that would indicate this, or reflect this journey from being a little second grader, first grader, and barely being able to write, to actually mastering cursive. Now, do you know that cursive writing is now defunct? Nobody knows how to do cursive? I, I do. I do. I, you see, I'm with some cursive people. And it would, it would then, toward the later grades, I mean, I remember, I don't know about you, but I would actually practice my, my signature. See, my dad had this very impressive signature. And so I, I thought, I've got to have my own signature, and I would practice it. So you'd see sheets of paper with me scrawling, and so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got that down. But you know what? Signatures are unique. Signatures are identifiable. Signatures authenticate. Signatures signify ownership. Signatures are legally individual and is thus binding in a court of law. Now, I'm not sure if this is said much anymore, but I remember being told 
to just put your Jan, John Hancock on the dotted line. Ever, anybody ever hear that? Did you ever stop to think what that was a reflection of it? It was a reference to the man who was the president of Congress when the Declaration of Independence was adopted and signed. John Hancock, he had a flamboyant signature and it was so instantly recognizable that his name became actually a synonym for signature. You know, the Merriam-Webster definition of seal includes the following. Something that confirms, ratifies, or makes secure. Guarantee, assurance, something with a, a cut or raised emblem, symbol, or word used specifically to clarify or certify a signature or authenticate a document. You know, when we formed our little church, we formed a 501c3, we were given a seal. See? Now, I'd be happy to authenticate your bulletin if you'd like. <laughs> I can do that later. But this is a seal. That makes it all official. Throughout Earth's history, seals have been a sign of authority. In the sixth chapter of Daniel, we read a familiar story. I better not see that seal punched into any of these. <laughs> In the sixth chapter of Daniel, we read a familiar story. It involves a king's seal. So it pleased Darius, the king of the Medes and Persians, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, three governors, of whom Daniel was one, <clears throat> that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. If you will allow me just to make an editorial comment here, that sounds very similar to what will happen to God's people at the very end. They will be good citizens. They won't be criminals, right? but they will have unique religious beliefs, non-mainstream religious practices, and that is exactly what the world will zero in on. Back to our story. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. Live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Now, it's really not hard to imagine that this proposed law was presented in such a way that King Darius was probably very flattered, don't you think? He thought, wow, what a, what a good group of guys I've got. They want to just elevate me to the top position. <laughs> Getting back to uh, what the Bible says, it says, therefore King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and they spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, don't you love that? That Daniel, have you ever had somebody say that? Those group, that group, that person, 
That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Now, I believe that if we were in that room, at that very moment, we would have seen the color drain out of King Darius's face. You know why? He'd been had. He knew that he had been duped by these other governors. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. <clears throat> now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought in before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. I think, I think he was very surprised when he got a response. I think he was probably already brokenhearted. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Amen. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. Amen. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Now just listen to this powerful testimony from, from a heathen king. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Now, you know what? Besides just being a, a powerful story of God's deliverance in spite of overwhelming odds, a story which by the way, I'm sure we will find very specific source of comfort, you know, in a specific source of comfort for all that go through the trials and tribulations that are soon to come upon us. But it also provides us with some clarity <clears throat> as to the importance of a seal. Here's another from the New Testament. We read in Matthew 27 that following the crucifixion on Sabbath, actually, I put on Sabbath, actually, because I thought it was interesting that, that the scribes and the rulers went to Pilate on Sabbath to make this request. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how the deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, will you have a guard? Go your way, make it as secure as you know how. 
So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. The Desire of Ages adds some details. Let me read from that. It says, The priests gave directions for securing the sepulcher. A great stone had been placed before the opening. Across the stone, they placed cords, securing the ends to the solid rock, sealing them with the Roman seal. The stone could not be moved without breaking the seal. Now, the Roman seal was a sign of authority. In fact, at this time in Earth's history, it was the ultimate, uh, the ultimate authority. It conveyed the authority of the Emperor of Rome. One more little side note. I learned from reading, I think, in Ellen White, you know, you think of, of this small little group of Roman soldiers, don't you, guarding the tomb? That's not correct. 150 soldiers. Do you think Satan didn't want Jesus to come out of that tomb? Yeah. But I also hope you're starting to more fully appreciate what it will mean to have the seal of God. Are you starting to get a picture of how important a seal is? In the book Christian Experience and Teachings, Ellen White describes a vision that she was given on a particular Sabbath in 1849. She says, I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues. Then I saw an angel fly with a commission from Jesus, swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do in the earth, and waving something up and down in his hand, crying with a loud voice, Hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers, and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth, that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds, and they were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. And he raised his hands to the Father, and he pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to those four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. At a later place in that same book, she adds a further explanation. When Jesus leaves the sanctuary, then they who are holy and righteous will be holy and righteous still. For all their sins will then be blotted out, and they will be sealed with the seal of the living God. But those that are unjust and filthy will be unjust and filthy still. For then there will be no priest in the sanctuary to offer their sacrifices, their confessions, and their prayers before the Father's throne. Therefore, what is done to rescue souls from the coming storm of wrath must be done before Jesus leaves the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So, let's kind of collect and analyze what we know about, about the seal of God. This sealing will take place just prior to the exact moment when our high priest, the Lord Jesus, leaves the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. You see, his work of mediation will be completed. In other words, probation will have closed. In the very next moment, God's chosen people, the remnant, will be sealed. Revelation 14.1 tells us exactly what that seal will be. It says, Then I looked and beheld, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Hmm. Now, would it be too big of a stretch of our imaginations to kind of visualize Jesus delivering to his father the list 
of his chosen from among all those left alive on earth. And the Father then inscribing his name on their foreheads. Okay, probably won't literally go down like that. And the Father's name is also more than likely figurative rather than literal. But in essence, that's exactly what will happen. The Father will sign his name on the foreheads of his people. See, one of the things that the sealing will do is to, is to further differentiate. In fact, it might even be more, be more accurate to say that this world will be brought to a place of absolute polarity. You know what I'm saying? You see, at that, at that point, this point in, in our Earth's history, there will be two, and only two, distinct classes. Those who follow God, those who keep his Sabbath, those who have the Father's name in their forehead, and those who don't. Yeah, the other thing we know is that the seven last plagues are about to fall. In fact, they are being delayed until God's people are sealed. Revelation 9.4 says, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And you know, I said this to you guys before. I, I'm looking at a group of intrepid truth seekers. And I want to ask you some serious questions. Do we fully realize what an incredible honor it would be to find ourselves included with the 144,000 mm -hmm. and to have God's name written on our forehead? Mm -hmm. That, that number, 144,000, I mean, it's, it's sort of a mysterious number, but maybe it's not. There are people that believe it's literal. Maybe it is, but it's not that many people. What will be required of us, though? Let me ask another question. What will be required of us in order to be part of that most special group of people. I want you to listen again to these words from Christian experience and teachings. I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble, listen, must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Must reflect the image of Jesus fully. In light of this Ellen White statement, listen to these words spoken by Jesus from the sixth chapter of John in verse 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Jesus was perfect in character, wasn't he? And the Father wrote his name on Jesus' forehead. He was sealed. Please listen to what I'm about to say. If we allow Jesus, by his precious Spirit, to fully live in us, our character will reflect the character of Christ. And the Father will write his name in our forehead. <coughs> Is that not an amazing thought? Continuing with Ellen White's words in the same book, she said, I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful, and we're looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Did you, did you hear that? Now, we've talked about the latter rain, but, they're, but she's saying that some people are, are playing that little waiting game. They're going, well, I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait until the latter, and then it's going to fix it all. 
She goes on, oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. So she's saying you've got to have the refreshing. But it isn't just going to come to you automatically. By default, it's not going to come to every single Adventist. She says those who refused, refused to be hewed by the prophets and failed to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth, the whole truth, and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is, will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. Before this time, the awful, awfully solemn declaration has gone forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. Hmm. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that, that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings can ever dwell in his presence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are so, so close, you guys. So close. I, I don't know how anybody could even kid themselves into thinking we're not close. Don't let anything distract you from being ready to meet Jesus. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing is worth losing eternal life for. The God of the universe wants to sign his name on your forehead. Just like a great artist who by signing his completed masterpiece instantly conveys authenticity, instantly conveys untold value. God wants to place his signature on us because we are his masterpiece of creation. We are made in his image. Jesus wants us to stand there with him and with the other 144,000, all having the Father's name lovingly and forever inscribed in our foreheads. We will have the character of Christ. We will be pure in heart. And Matthew 5, 8 tells us, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Did you get that? We will be pure in heart, and we're told that because we're pure in heart, we shall see God. Amen. Anybody here want to see God? Amen. Amen. I don't want to. Nobody's seen God. Moses saw a tiny little sliver of God. Is it going to be worth Losing this world? Is it going to be worth surrendering ourselves to him? Is it going to be worth becoming a peculiar people? Is it going to be worth being changed into his likeness? Jeff, you, you, you always say, I want to follow the lamb wherever he goes. Amen. That's, that's what he's asking us to do. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Anybody need healing? And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. 
and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Amen. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Is it going to be worth it? Yeah. Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> 